Hey, what's up you guys? This is Josh Tongo, and I just wanted to come out with another video. Just kind of sharing my heart and just where I'm at right now and my understanding of certain things. And just like many of you guys out there, a lot of us have grown up as like evangelicals and some of us have had to unlearn and learn a lot of things throughout the years. And you know what you guys, that's okay. And growing up, I, I basically had times where I was in, in types of communities where it was, it was bad to question things. And in fact, it's like once you become a Christian, they tell you this is what you have to believe as a Christian. And sometimes it doesn't even make sense. But what I do ask for you guys is as you watch and listen to what I'm going to share, just to have an open mind and to have an open heart. What happened on the, on the cross when Jesus died for us? And it's really important because the way you view God will dictate the way you live out your life. And what I'm going to be doing in this video is that I'm going to be challenging something called penal substitutionary theory. And a lot of evangelicals won't like that when I attach the word theory to penal substitution because many of them will say, no, this is the gospel. And I'm having some questions that I'm dealing with now saying, you know, I'm finding some problems with it. And I hope that as I share my thoughts, my views, that you're going to have an open mind to at least consider what I'm saying and then you make a judgment for yourself in the end of what you want to believe. I believe that what happened there at the cross when Jesus died for our sins is that it was a revelation of God's love and not a revelation of His wrath being poured out on His Son. And I just want to suggest to people that when you read the Bible, that the best way to understand the Scriptures is through Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority of how we understand the Bible. Now, what is penal substitutionary theory all about? Just to give you a little brief definition of what it is, basically is that God sends His one and only Son because of His love, and the Son comes willingly to die on the cross for our sins, to satisfy the justice of God. And basically what Jesus did is that He comes to die in our place. He takes upon our punishment, our penalty, because He loves us. So on the cross, according to penal substitutionary theory, God's love and God's holiness is manifested. And I want to break down for you guys how the Gospel is typically shared. It goes like this. God is a holy God in a legal sense. And what happened is that man sinned. And sinning is primarily breaking God's law. And because they broke God's law, therefore they're guilty. But because God is holy, He can't allow sin to go unpunished. But because He's also just, justice requires punishment, and His wrath must be satisfied. But at the same time, God is also love. So He sends His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sin. And it was at that very moment where the guilt of humanity was put upon Jesus Christ, and the Father's wrath was put upon His Son in order to take on the full punishment for our sin. And it was at that very moment where Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And supposedly it's interpreted as like this, because God is too holy, He cannot look upon sin. So at that very moment, the Father turned His face away from His Son, abandoned Him, and allowed Him to be forsaken in order for Him to take on the full punishment for mankind. And what I started to see and understand is that in the Western tradition, concepts of holiness and the gospel were interpreted through something called medieval feudalism. And things were explained through Reformation era juridical metaphors, things like law and punishment and justice, etc. And it was through this understanding that shaped the way we understood God and the gospel. And if you were to go up to any Christian and ask them if they are saved, they're basically going to say yes. But I guess a bigger question would be to ask, what are you saved from? Or who are you saved from? And you're going to find a bunch of different kinds of answers to that. Some will say we're saved from sin, we're saved from hell, we're saved from death. But according to this penal substitutionary view, many people have acknowledged that ultimately you are saved from God. Think about that. Jesus saves you from God? What kind of God is that? God is basically saying this. I manage you because of your sin. And because I'm holy, somebody needs to pay. Somebody needs to be punished. But because I love you, I'm going to kill my own son, my own innocent son, just so I won't be mad at you anymore. Some people have actually tried to challenge me on this, those who hold the penal substitutionary theory, and they would give me examples like, well, we have to understand that Jesus' life is like a sacrifice. It's like Him taking a bullet for you. And I was trying to point out that that's probably not the best analogy to use because according to penal substitutionary theory, if Jesus took the bullet for us, guess who pulls the trigger? The Father. No one embraced this theory in the early church all the way up to the 1100s, or should I say the 1500s. You see, the initial development was from Anselm's satisfaction theory in the 11th century, but it wasn't later formulated until the 1500s under the reformers. 
So when I come across a lot of Christians, especially evangelicals, that say, no, this is the orthodox view, this is what's always been taught in the early church, it boggles my mind. So what does Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 say? Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. And so when people read that verse in Isaiah 53 4, they say, see, it's right there, penal substitution. It says it right there that he was stricken by God. But then I'll tell people, look at it again. What does it say? We considered him stricken by God. We considered him. Because that's what they believed in the ancient world. But that wasn't the case. It was us who put him on that cross. It was us who made him suffer. It wasn't God. God wasn't the one punishing him. In fact, this is a prophecy of the error of penal substitution. What about Isaiah 53 10? It says, But the Lord delighted to crush him making him sick. If his soul would make a guilt offering, he will see a descendant, he will survive days, and the delight of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And so people will look at that verse and say, look, check it out right there. It says that the Lord delighted to crush him or it pleased them to bruise him. But then it makes me wonder, do you even hear what you're just saying of what you're quoting? And do you even wonder if that's even a good thing to be saying? You know, is there something wrong there? that it pleased him to bruise him, or delighted him to crush him, or to make him sick. And you know, I think it's best that we look into these things and say, what's going on here? And I just want to give credit to where credit is due and give it to a guy named Bob Ekblad, who is a Hebrew scholar and a practitioner of restorative justice. And what he discovered is just amazing. And this is the Septuagint, Isaiah 53 verse 10. And the Lord desires to purify him of the plague. If you would give him a sin offering, your soul will see long-lived posterity and the Lord desires to take away. Now I don't know about you, but that sounds completely different than the translations that we have. And what Bob discovered is that this whole idea of God punishing the servant and making him suffer is completely absent in the Septuagint. And I think that should give us some food for thought of understanding what is actually going on in Isaiah 53. God is not to blame for the suffering of the servant. Number one, it divides the Trinity. For example, because of your sin, all of a sudden there's one side of God that's against you, the Father. He's angry towards you. He has His wrath against you. And there's another side of God that's for you, Jesus Christ, who what? He comes to save you from the Father's wrath. There's something weird about that, folks. If we just really think about it, you have to ask yourself the question, where is the unity among the Trinity? Think about it. There's a need that exists inside the Father that is not existent inside of the Son. So why did Jesus cry out those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The textual source of that is actually found in Psalm 22. And once you check out Psalm 22 and you look at the context of what's going on, it's pretty clear of what's happening. Psalm 22, 24 says this, For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him but has listened to his cry for help. Folks, at the cross, the Father never forsook the Son. He never abandoned the Son. In fact, at the cross, the Father and Son were triumphant. It was at that very moment where Christ identified with every single person who has felt abandoned. He identified with every single person who felt alienated and forsaken. For where was the Father at that very moment? 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. According to this model, God can't simply forgive. He needs some sort of payment. There's a debt that's owed to Him, and He's not going to forgive unless that debt is paid. If you owe me money, and you can't pay me, and then somebody else comes along and pays me the money on your behalf, and then I say, okay, now I'm going to forgive you. Folks, if that happened, you think I'm crazy. That is not forgiveness. I got my money. And if we talk about this whole thing that Jesus paid a debt that we could not pay, and if He overpaid it, what is left to forgive? There's no debt to forgive. True forgiveness is not saying your debt was paid, now you are forgiven, especially when it's a gift by a third party. No, true forgiveness is saying this, I release you from your debt. That's forgiveness. If a debt was paid in full, and I know a lot of people like to use that, paid in full, there's no debt to forgive. Forgiveness by definition cannot be a payment. 
If He only forgave us once His justice was satisfied and the debt was paid in full, or when He needs blood that needs to be shed, then how do you explain the forgiveness of Jesus Christ when He forgave other people? Or that time when the paralytic came in through the roof with his friends and Jesus Christ forgave him? There was no sacrifice. There was no blood that was shed. See, what penal substitution teaches in many ways contradicts the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. See, what Jesus Christ did is that when He came on the scene, He corrected many of the false perceptions that people had of God. Because Jesus who came as God in the flesh, Jesus says, If you want to know God, look at me. Because when you see me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus constantly would look at people and tell people, You know, you've heard it said, you've heard it said, but let me tell you, let me tell you. So the God of penal substitution is kind of this eye for an eye kind of God who looks very different from the God revealed in Jesus Christ who tells us to turn the other cheek and to forgive. But according to penal substitutionary theory, somebody has to pay, right? But is that really justice? And what I've come to see is that there's been a big difference of how we understand justice in the West and how the Hebrew mindset understood justice. In the West, the way we understand justice is punishment. You get what you deserve. It's retributive. But in the Hebrew mind, they don't think of justice as punishment, but rather it's restorative. In other words, true justice in the biblical sense is where justice and mercy go hand in hand. In fact, when you look at the scriptures, you can say that violence and justice are complete opposites, that if there is one, the other one will be canceled out. Micah 6, 8 says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness or mercy? True justice is about bringing peace and doing righteous acts and being redemptive and being merciful. In other words, it's the way that Jesus lived and taught. Justice to many people is giving to them what they deserve. But then check this out what Jesus says. You know what you do to those people that have hurt you? Those that have wronged you and become your enemy? Jesus says, love them. Forgive them. Turn the other cheek. Now, if we want to be consistent and say that Jesus suffered on our behalf, that He was punished on our behalf as a substitute, and He was punished instead of us, people also argue and say that He also suffered our hell. Now, we believe, we've been taught that if you reject Jesus Christ, that you're going to suffer a hell for all eternity. You will be suffering an eternal hell. But if that's the case, and He was our substitute and took upon the full punishment, then why was Jesus on the cross for only several hours and not for an eternity? Just take the classic parable that many people use whenever they share the gospel. Now this is the message of redemption that people will use, and that's the parable of the prodigal son. Now imagine the father having the two sons, Then one of the sons goes off and does all these stupid things, and you know, he, he squanders everything, and then he comes back, and then the father is just completely outraged because of his son's sin. And just imagine that the father will not take him back, the father will not forgive him unless some sort of payment is made. And then all of a sudden, the brother comes along, and the other brother comes along and says, you know what, Dad, uh, I know it wasn't my fault and that I'm innocent, but why don't you just kill me so justice will be served and so that you won't be mad at my brother anymore. So what happened in the parable? The father embraced the son. He showed him unconditional love and forgiveness. Why? Because that's what changes the human heart. That is what true justice is all about. It's not retributive. It's not about punishment. It's restoration of the father having all of his children come home. That is the justice that the Bible speaks of. Now I understand that some of you watching this video might have a lot of questions in your mind. And that's okay. And I understand that I can't answer everything in this video. Anyways, you know why? Because I don't know everything. This is where I'm at. This is how I actually understand my father. This is how I understand the scriptures. Now I don't understand everything. But we're all on a journey here. And you know what? I still have a lot of questions. There's still some things I'm still figuring out on this journey that I have with God. But you know what? I know that I could be wrong. I understand that. But so can you. And my prayer is that in spite of all of our differences, that as we're continuing to learn and to grow together as a body of Christ, we can just learn just to love each other and just to respect each other. And what if maybe, just maybe, one day we'll realize that God is a lot nicer than we think.